everyone uh, and welcome and thank you for joining us for another session in our University of the Philippines and the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation's webinar series on Stop COVID Deaths, Clinical Management Updates on the Management of COVID-19 Cases and the Infection. I'm Dr. Raymond Francis Sarmiento uh, from the U UP Manila National Institutes of Health, National Telehealth Center, and joining me at and Phil, Dr. Susie. Hi, uh, hello everyone. Hi Raymond and um, welcome everyone to the webinar. I think we lost you for a couple of <laughs> seconds there Raymond. But anyway, we'd like to welcome everyone. We hope you're all um, safe, in good health and um, we'd just like to thank you for joining us today. We have a very important topic. Of course, we all, we all want to learn more about how we can manage patients who have COVID. And um, today we're going to talk about uh, nephrology. So um, before we go into anything else, I just want to, to say that uh, this is an initiative of the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation and the University of the Philippines. Uh, this partnership is meant to help reach out to all the doctors, nurses, healthcare workers out there who would like to know more about um, what the Philippines is doing, what is the latest and what's the state of the art in the management of COVID-19. Thank you, Dr. Susi. Uh, traditionally, we will go on to our pre-test poll questions. But before that, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, all the members of the teams uh, who are making this possible, starting with the Office of the President at the University of the Philippines, led by Executive Vice President Dr. Teodoro Herbosa, the Office of the Vice President for Public Affairs, Dr. Elena Pernia, uh, the TVUP, led by Dr. Gigi Alfonso, uh, the University of the Philippines, uh, ITDC, who has been very instrumental po in uh, supporting us uh, in the technical aspects and whenever we have technical difficulties, nandiyan po sila. The University of the Philippines, Manila, National Institutes of Health, and also the Philippine General Hospital, and finally, the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation. So, uh, before we get started uh, with the introduction of our guest speaker, uh, for today, uh, we'll be talking about a very important topic. Uh, let's go to our pre-test poll questions. And uh, those questions, Paul, you could, uh, you could click on the poll uh, section of the Zoom webinar. We have two uh, pre-webinar questions uh, as a tradition. And the first one, it reads, Paul, the receptor for SARS-CoV-2 in the cell is the, so option A, uh, AC ACE, option 2 is ACE1, option C is ACE2, and option D is ACE3. So please uh, log in your answers and uh, so we could see po, uh, how many choose which answers and Dr. Uh, our guest, guest speaker po will uh, uh, provide the correct answers po towards the end of our webinar. Okay, so far uh, most of our um, attendees choose option C, ACE2. And malalaman po natin later on kung yun po ang tamang kasagutan. So please uh, get into our uh, the poll and answer your, uh, answer our question number one. So it looks like we have an extra question for today, uh, but uh, that's that's uh, that's a happy coincidence point. We're very thankful to our guest speaker for providing that. But for question number two, it says which of the following organs has the highest concentration of SARS-CoV-2 receptor? So most of you po uh, answered uh, option A. So uh, so options po is option A, lungs. Option B is heart. Option C is kidneys. And option D is muscle. Uh, and then for our third question, which of the following modalities of blood purification can remove cytokines? The, the options are option A, hemodialysis. Option B, hemodial filtration. Option C, continuous renal replacement therapy. And option D, hemoperfusion. So, dito po, may pagka, mayro pong almost an equal uh, distribution on options A, uh, hemodialysis, option D, hemodial filtration, and option D, hemoperfusion. So, please continue on and log in those answers. Uh, and we will get the chance to receive and hear the correct answers from our guest speaker, whom... Uh, my co-host, Dr. Susie Mercado, will introduce right now. Okay, well, we were supposed to have uh, short opening remarks from the President of the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation, 
but we had some technical glitches. I think this is normal in the new normal is that we'll have to deal with, you know, technical issues. So we're going to have the president of PhilHealth towards the end just to give a short message. But it's my honor to present to you um, our speaker for today. As you know, uh, COVID-19 in most cases, 80% are mild, uh, sometimes it's symptomatic. But for the 20% who have to be hospitalized, the literature says there's 20 to 30% who have some kind of a renal problem associated with COVID. So we're going to learn a little bit more about that from a um, very well-known nephrologist. Uh, she's a, a professor at the UP College of Medicine. She's also the vice president of the Philippine uh, Nephrology Society. So my pleasure to welcome um, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Montemayor. Beth, welcome uh, to this webinar. And thank you for your time uh, here with us today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Susie, and thank you for inviting me. It is really a great privilege for me to, to talk on this very important topic, COVID and the kidneys. And I would like to thank, of course, Bill Hell, the UP University of the Philippines, and of course, the National Telehealth, the National Center for uh, Health, uh, for telehealth. And uh, the drive to stop COVID by the PhilHealth, stop COVID death by PhilHealth is really very important, knowing that there is a high mortality of uh, patients in, afflicted with the COVID disease. And uh, the global death rate is about 6 to 7%. But as we talk about the patients with kidney problems, you will realize that this very special group of patients will need very special attention. Okay, so I will talk on the uh, COVID-19 and the kidneys and what is the relationship of COVID-19 and the kidneys. And for this uh, lecture, see, and for this lecture, I will talk about the four different kinds of patients that we usually see who have kidney disease. The patients with chronic kidney disease, and most of them will be on ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blockers. The patients on dialysis, the kidney transplant patients, and the patients who are hospitalized and developed acute kidney injury. The, here, this is data from WHO, and, uh, uh, and it shows here the prevalence of chronic kidney disease in the Western Pacific area. And here you will see that the Philippines has a 9.3 prevalence per uh, the, the prevalence of chronic kidney disease in the Philippines is 9.31. So if you're talking about a population of more than 200 million people, we are talking really of about 18 million patients having chronic kidney disease. And what is the significance of that? Patients with chronic kidney disease seems to have a high association with severe COVID. So patients with chronic kidney disease will have a three times risk of developing severe COVID-19. And this should be emphasized because patients with chronic kidney disease should be advised to take extra precaution to minimize the risk of exposure to the virus. And the physicians who are engaged in the care of these chronic kidney disease patients should be really monitoring them for the timely detection of disease progression. So uh, most of these patients will be on various medications, but mostly they will be on the drug angiotensin converting receptor blockers or angiotensin and angiotensin receptor blockers or angiotensin converting enzymes because this is highly recommended and this is the guide one of the guideline one of the guides guidelines in the uh, chronic uh, in the clinical practice guidelines it's highly recommended so let's look at the role of the renin angiotensin or those uh, renin angiotensin we'll stop at angiotensin and review briefly the pathways. There are actually two pathways. The angiotensin, the ACE angiotensin 2 and AT1 or angiotensin 1 receptor and 
the other pathway, which is A2, angiotensin 1, 7, to the mast receptors. So we will start with angiotensinogen, which is a big molecule. And this is broken down into a small 10 amino acid molecule by renin. And this substance now is called angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is acted by, upon by the angiotensin converting enzyme to angiotensin 2, which is an 8 amino acid. And angiotensin 2 binds with an AT1 receptor. And here, will, when it binds to its AT1 rece receptor, will uh, cause so many deleterious effects. There's vasoconstriction, which causes hypertension, increased fibrosis, increased inflammation, increased thrombosis, increased pulmonary damage, which means that there's increase in edema, uh, pulmonary edema and permeability. On the other side here, angiotensin 2 is converted by ACE2 to angiotensin 1,7. And angiotensin 1,7 binds either to an A2, AT2 receptor, or more importantly, it binds to the mass receptor. And the effect when angiotensin 1,7 binds to the mass receptor is increased vasodilatation, fibrosis, decreased fibrosis, decreased inflammation, decreased thrombosis, and decreased pulmonary edema. So in other words, the axis ACE2, angiotensin 1-7 mass and mass receptor, is counter-regulatory to the deleterious effect of AT1 receptor. ACE is a highly expressed in the different uh, in the different organs, and you have uh, ACE in in all, all almost organs: central nervous system, upper airway, vasculature, lungs, liver, eyes, heart, kidneys, and the gut. The kidneys are affected by uh, by uh, by. There are ACE receptors in the kidneys, and the expression of ACE receptors in the kidneys are higher compared to the lungs. The, there is 100 times more ACE receptor in the kidneys compared to the lungs. Now, unfortunately, ACE is also the receptor for COVID. ACE2 is also the receptor for COVID. And you can see here an illustration of ACE2. It has two domains, one which is uh, transmembrane and almost intracellular, and one is extracellular. And this extracellular domain, the N terminus, is the site where COVID, the COVID virus, can tightly bind to the ACE2. And when, ACE, and when this happens, the virus binding to the ACE2 gets internalized, and now you have here the virus in the cell, and this is where the virus can cause the damage. Now, what happens when the virus binds to the ACE2, it, lost, it loses its protective effect because it has been utilized by the virus. And so the conversion now of angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1-7, which leads to a cascade of events, which is protective to the body, is now in the favor of more angiotens angiotensin 2 binding to an AT1 receptor and more of the detrimental effects will be seen, like fibrosis, increase in the reactive oxygen spe species, hypertrophy, vasoconstrictive, and the gut dysbiosis. There is uh, a small amount of ACE, which is circulating, of ACE2, which is circulating, and this is uh, caused by the pinching off of, of this ACE from its, um, from its transmembrane, uh, transmembrane part. And so you have here an ACE, which is potentially beneficial because it can coat the virus and therefore prevent the virus from interacting with the transmembrane bound ACE. And so one, uh, one proposed intervention for this, and uh, which is being in the, which is in the pipeline, is the recomb recombinant ACE2, which can potentially coat the virus 
and when coated now, can no longer bind with the transmembrane bound ACE and will just allow, and this will just allow the body to dispose of this virus. So here is the um, comparison of the angiotensin level in the healthy and the COVID patients. And you can see because of the utilization of ACE2 by the virus, that angiotensin level is higher in the healthy individual compared, uh, is higher in the COVID-19 patient compared to the healthy individual. So we see that um, when the virus loses its, uh, combines, when the virus com combines with ACE2, it loses, the ACE2 is, the function of the, the beneficial function of ACE2 is lost. And there, again, you have a predominance of the effect of angiotensin 2 binding with your angiotensin 1 receptor. Now, where is the controversy here? The use of angiotensin enzyme inhibitor and the use of angiotensin receptor blocker appear to increase the expression of ACE2 receptors. And so the beneficial effect will be that there will be, because of the increased expression of or the upregulation of the ACE2 receptors, more angiotensin 2 will be degraded and the pathway ACE2 angiotensin 1-7 and mass receptor pathway will be promoted. However, the bad effect of this is that there will be more receptors for the SARS-CoV and more virus entering the cell. So what really is the effect of the use of ASR among the hypertensive COVID-19 patients? And here we have this uh, data coming from the Wuhan, Wuhan group of one th more than a thousand patients with hypertension, 118 of them were on ACE ARB and 900 were on non ACE with a median age of 64 years. And what is the mortality rate for, uh, for this group? Did ACE ARB affect uh, increase the mortality? No, it did not. You see the mortality rate for those uh, on ACE ARB was 3.7%, while those on non-ACE ARB was 9.8%, and that is significant. And if we look at the hazards ratio, for all cause mortality, there is in fact a decrease in the risk of dying when patients are on ACE ARB. And for the risk of having of uh, developing septic shock, ARDS, acute kidney injury, or acute heart injury, you see no significant difference between those who are on ACE ARB and those who are not on ACE ARBs. Okay, and here's another study on more, again, on the more than 117 patients, 362 of whom were hypertensives, uh, 115 on ACE ARB, 247 non ACE ARB, with a median age of 66 years. Now, the in total in hospitality mortality rate was 11%, but for if the patient is hypertensive, the mortality rate increases to 21.3. Among the ACE ARB users, those who will have severe infections and those who do not have uh, severe infections are similar. So you have a non-significant uh, difference between the development of severe infection and non-severe infections among the ACE ARB users. And the survivor, uh, the difference between the survivors and non-survivors are also similar in the, ARB, uh, in the ACE ARB users. Okay, however, here is a meta-analysis on the studies uh, conducted. The, the outcome here, for example, test positivity, there is no difference, significant difference, whether you are on ACE or the chances of getting the COVID infection is similar. However, if you're going to see hospital admission as outcome, 
there will be more patients who will be admitted, which means that maybe they will have more severe COVID infection when they are on ACE or ARB compared to those who are not on ACE or ARB. And the ICU admissions, there will be higher rates of ICU admissions among those who are on ACE versus non-ACE and among those who were on ACE ARB versus those who are not on ACE ARB. However, in the use of the ventilator, there is no difference between those who would have respiratory failures among, between those who are on ACE ARB or not on ACE ARB. So, knowing this, we did a survey, the, the Philippine Society of Nephrology uh, did a survey among the different training institutions and ask them what is the general approach with regard to renin angiotensin inhibitor for admitted patients with COVID. And 11 of them out of the, there were 11 responders, so 11 training institutions, 91% of them will continue with the use of ACE ARB but, and only a one, one, one institution will stop will stop the use of ACE ARB. Okay. However, as a precautionary measure, we have to balance the potential benefits and harms. Okay. So we balance the potential benefits and harms from continuing ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker therapy during an acute infection. And this is going to depend on the reason for prescribing. Many of these patients would take this for long-term benefits like control of hypertension and prevention of deterioration of kidney function. However, if the blood pressure is well controlled and the, beep, and the kidney function is stable, we can opt to continue using ACE or ARB for, standard, for those with standard risk of COVID-19, but with those for those who have high risk of COVID-19, like household contacts or healthcare workers, consider stopping. Now, for those who have current benefits, like those with severe or uncontrolled, severe or uncontrolled hypertension or heart failure, where the use of ACE are is really indicated, then continue with the use of ACE ARB even if you're positive or negative for COVID. Okay, then that's just, that's a precautionary measure. Now, so to summarize this, uh, the, the chronic kidney disease patients, we see that the chronic kidney disease patient is, chronic kidney disease is associated with higher risk of severe COVID-19. The receptor for SARS-CoV-2 is ACE2. The ACE2 receptors reduce the adverse effects of angiotensin II, not only by degrading angiotensin II, thereby eliminating or limiting its deleterious potential, but also by generating angiotensin 1-7, which exerts numerous salutary and oppose, opposite or counter-regulatory effects to those of angiotensin II through an efficient binding with the receptor mass and the angiotensin type 2 receptors. Therefore, the ACE2 angiotensin 1-7 mass receptor axis is counter-regulatory to ACE angiotensin 2 angiotensin 1 receptor axis. The use of ACE ARB upregulates ACE2 and therefore there will be more receptors for the SARS for the SARS-CoV virus. And the use of ACE, are, however, the use of ACE or ARB is not associated with increased mortality, but is associated with more hospitalizations and ICU admissions. Now let's look at the kidney transplant patients. The kidney transplant recipients are really all the immunosuppressed host because all of them have to take multiple immunosuppressants including glucocorticoids, azathioprine, tacrolimu, cyclosporin, mycophenolic, mofetil, and they have to take these for life to prevent rejection after transplantation. And we know that the main role of these immunosuppressants 
is to suppress the body's immune system, significantly reducing their capabilities to prevent infections with the various pathogens. So let's look at the kidney transplant patients, and this is the experience of the Montefiore Medical Center in New York. They had 36 kidney transplant patients with a mean age of 60 years. The percentage, only 50% of them would present with fever and 22% with diarrhea. The mean follow-up is only 21 days. And in this, um, in this group of patients, the main laboratory finding is lymphopenia in 79%, thrombocytopenia in 68%, and they have a low CD3, CD4, and CD8 count, uh, implying their very uh, suppressed immune state. Now, what is the outcome of, the, of what is the outcome here? Mortality is very high. Remember, in the general population, mortality is only about six to seven percent, but for the transplant patients, the mortality is high, 28%. And two of them came from the recently transplanted patients. So eight of these patients, the, this 36 uh, kidney transplant patients, eight of the, them were managed as outpatient, and these two who died were, those, were among those who managed as outpatient. So which means that they initially had very mild presentation but deteriorated rapidly. Now, here's another um, study, and this time from the Italian experience. They have 20 kidney transplant patients who were admitted for SARS, CoV-2 pneumonia, and the median follow-up follow here is only is seven days. They have been on trans, on uh, trans. Uh, they have been transplanted for the average of 13 years, and the following were their immunosuppressions. When they were admitted, the immunosuppression medicines were withdrawn, and the medicines, the following medicines were given. They were placed on methylprednisolone and hydrochlor hydroxychloroquine and the antivirals. Okay, so what happened in terms of course of the disease, 87 had worsening x-ray and 85% and had escalation of oxygen supplemental therapy. And the outcome here, you see four of 20 had ICU care, six of 20 had acute kidney injury, and five out of 20 died. So this translates to mortality of 25%. So the conclusion here is that SARS-CoV-2 induced pneumonia is characterized by high risk of progression and significant mortality. So remember that the mean follow-up here was only seven days. So from admission to death, the average is um, only seven days. So what are the characteristics of the transplant patients with COVID-19? They present with diversified clinical symptoms. If fever is present in 98% or 90% of cases in the general population, only about 50% of them will prevent with fever. They have low levels of CD3, CD4, and CD8, implying their immune suppressed state. They have, they develop more severe pneumonia. They have more rapid clinical deterioration and they have higher and earlier mortality. And so the question now is, how are you going to manage the COVID-19 patients? As an outpatient, you can, do, you can do this as an outpatient, but the main thing here is that enhanced protection against the COVID uh, contact with the virus should be emphasized to the transplant patient particularly because of the very, very high mortality rate. For diagnostic testing, any, any symptomatic patient with history of uh, exposure to an infected uh, individual should be diagnosed, should, be, uh, should undergo testing. If with definitive or presumptive diagnosis of COVID-19, it is appropriate to remain at home 
if the following criteria are met, lack of fever, no dyspnea, maintaining adequate oral intake, and the ability to maintain close communication with their transplant team. Hospitalization should be considered for patients with any of the following, worsening of symptoms, O2 saturation below 94%, significant laboratory abnormalities, abnormal uh, chest X-ray radiograph, and high sensitivity CRP on two executive reading, consecutive readings. And for the treatment strategies, we have to watch out for drug interactions. For example, lopinavir, rituanavir, can increase the levels of tacrolimus or cyclosporine. And in terms of using the immunosuppressive drugs, the cell cycle inhibitors like azathioprine, mycophenolate mofetil should be continued. Calcineurin inhibitors should be reduced and steroid dose should be individualized. Okay, so what is the status now in the COVID era of the solid organ transplantation? In the United States, they did a survey on the different transplant centers and 88 transplant centers responded. Most of the transplant centers would suspend their living donor kidney transplant program. So 71.8% of the transplant centers have suspended the living donor kidney transplant program. And in the Philippines, here is the statement of the Philippine Society of Transplant Surgeons. We recommend that all living and assist organ transplant surgical procedures will be suspended indefinitely. The problems and the challenges in doing kidney transplantation during the COVID time is that are, are the following. SARS-CoV-2 infection could be missed in both donors and recipients who are asymptomatic owing to the sensitivity issues with the, the present uh, gold standard test for the coronavirus. So remember that we might have only a 70% sensitivity test for the RT-PCR, and we might be missing uh, the asymptomatic individual who might be harboring the virus and who are, un who are about to undergo the kidney transplantation. The, the resources in the present time are scars because of uh, the focus on the management of the, trans the COVID patients. There is also this logistical difficulty in ensuring a clean and microbiologically safe pathways within hospitals for transplant patients. And there is this increased susceptibility to the SARS-CoV-2 infection in the immediate post-operative period and after hospital discharge owing to the induction therapy and immunosuppressive treatment. And emergency surgical procedures like kidney biopsy, if there is uh, allograft rejection, or allograft nephrectomy if there's bleeding or there's sepsis from the transplanted kidney, or open revascularization procedures may be a bit difficult to perform because of the difficulty in mobilizing the operating room. Okay, now let's go to the hemodialysis patients. The hemodialysis patients comprise a distinct population in the COVID-19 outbreak. There is a lar relatively num large number of hemodialysis patients. We just look at the, the data, the 2016 data, almost 60,000 patients are on dialysis. In the United States, about 500,000 patients are on hemodialysis. And the unique characteristic of this COVID patient is that while the general population has to remain at home to prevent contact with the COVID disease, these patients have to come to the dialysis units at least three times a week. So they are mobile traveling from home to dialysis facilities and other healthcare settings, and they can serve as potential vectors of the infection. 
lengthy treatments and they are in close proximity to other patients in the dialysis staff. We allow a six feet distance between these two patients, but again, that is still close proximity. And the hemodialysis patients have impaired immune function and have multiple comorbidities. They are hypertensive, they have diabetes, they have cardiovascular diseases. And if you look at the presence of comorbidities, the presence of these comorbidities would increase the risk of these patients for severe COVID disease. For example, hypertension increases the risk by 2.3, 2.36, diabetes by two times, presence of respiratory problems 2.46 times, and for cardiovascular disease, the risk of developing severe COVID disease is increased to 3.4 times. So having comorbidities will increase the risk of severe COVID disease and these comorbidities are commonly present in the hemodialysis patients. What's the clinical presentation of COVID-19 in the hemodialysis patients? And here's the experience from Wuhan. They had 7,154 patients on dialysis and 154 of them got COVID, uh, uh, were in, got infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So, while 77% presented with mild or moderate symptoms, 30% presented with severe or critical symptoms. The mean age of these patients is 63 years. Now, look at the presence of comorbidities. Cardiovascular disease in 68%, diabetes in 22.9%, uh, respiratory problems in 3.8%, and we said that these comorbidities will increase the risk for severe COVID uh, disease. The clinical presentation is variable. And again, you see that they don't really present uh, symptomatically. Only 51% will have fever, 45% will have fatigue, 37% will have cough. The most common presentation, again, is lymphopenia. And the characteristic chest, chest CT scan finding is the ground uh, glass opacity. In Spain, they have looked into 36 maintenance hemodialysis patients who were COVID-19 positive. And um, the clinical course of these patients, uh, they again presented with fever, cough, fatigue, but not all of them will only about half of them will be symptomatic. The peripheral ground glass opacity is present uh, in, 22, uh, in 22 of the 36 patients only, and seven will have normal chest CT scan or X-ray. Now, in this particular um, group of patients, the mortality was 30.5%, so really very high mortality. And what are the predictors of mortality? Longer time of dialysis. The longer you are on dialysis, the greater is the risk for death or increased LDH level and low lymphocyte count. These are markers for prognosis. Again, um, Looking at uh, this experience in Spain, of the mixed types of end-stage kidney patients, 46 patients on, dialysis, on hemodialysis, 46% uh, on hemodialysis, 4% on peritoneal dialysis, and 51% kidney transplant patients. You again can see that the mean time to diagnosis from onset of symptoms, just one day for the dialysis group and three days for the kidney transplant group. So the course is quite rapid for them. 61% would have ground glass opacities, 
and the rest will have a bilateral renal involvement. Now, what is the mortality for this group? Seven out of 25 in the dialysis group, that translates to about 28%. And six out of 26 in the kidney transplant group died, so about 23%. So you can see really the high mortality of the kidney patients on dialysis and uh, patients who have transplant. Again, another study in Brescia, Italy, on 643 patients who developed, uh, some of whom developed uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, were just managed, uh, 37 of them were managed as outpatient, 57 were managed as inpatient, and of these patients who were managed as outpatient, still 8% of them died. And of those who were managed as inpatient, 42 of them died. So even if you have a mild presentation where management can be done as an outpatient, still there is a high risk of mortality. So, and this brings us to the point of having this algorithm because patients on maintenance dialysis treatment are primarily a high risk group. Dialysis facilities, dialysis facilities must have in place a method of detecting and screening and managing the dialysis, um, the dialysis patients. So in this particular center, they use the chest CT scan for screening because the results come, they get the results much faster than the result of the, the throat swab. So if the chest CT scan is normal, then they will treat in the routine dialysis unit. They do routine dialysis in the usual hemodialysis, in the regular hemodialysis unit. If the CT scan shows non-viral pneumonia, they can do routine dialysis still, but there's an examination of the chest x-ray after seven to 14 days of treatment. And if there's negative or no progression of the CT, continue here in the regular hemodialysis unit. The problem now comes with those who have a CT scan which shows viral pneumonia. If the temperature, if the patients were febrile, they can be dialyzed in a dialysis, in a room dedicated for the COVID patient. If the patient is febrile, dialysis is put on hold and they refer the patients to the fever clinic for throat swabbing. And if positive, they refer the patients to a designated dialysis center. So what is the point of emphasis here? That the point of emphasis here is that we must have a dedicated COVID, we must have a dedicated COVID positive dialysis center, whether in the hospital or in the freestanding unit. So for outpatients, for patients who can be managed as outpatient, they can be dialyzed in the designated centers for COVID positive patients. But for the more severe pneumonia, they, can, they have to be admitted and dialyzed in the dedicated areas of the hospital. However, CT scan is the usual uh, screening test for the patients, for the hemodialysis patients. But we have to take note that Uremic patients will have also findings of ground glass opacities. And this is a study before the COVID area on the uremic symptomatic patients. And they noted that 45% of the CT scan findings will be that of the findings we said, we say today as pathognomonic of COVID uh, infection. So here we might have a patient who presents with a ground glass opacity on CT scan and will be managed 
as a COVID patient, only to find out later that he is not, he is COVID negative. So in the meantime, he has been exposed to the COVID floors and or the hemodialysis, his hemodialysis schedule has been deferred while waiting for the hemodial for the seat, for the results of the throat swab. So, and you must remember that patients with COVID, hemodialysis patients with COVID-19 will have different methods of uh, handling their uh, COVID virus. Among, in this 34 patients who had COVID-19, and they did very aggressive COVID testing here, repeat swabs every 48 hours, they noted that only 20 patients had negative results within 15 days, and nine of the patients still were COVID positive after 21 days or until the end of the study. So it takes time really for the hemodialysis patients to clear themselves of the, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Okay. So what is the Philippine situation here? A lot of patients in the hemodialysis units get COVID-19. Uh, COVID Most of them get displaced from his hemodialysis unit because the freestanding units have no capacity to accept the COVID positive patients. They cannot shoulder the cost of the PPEs, the cost of using single use dialyzers, and the cost of sanitation procedures. There are many, and here we have a count of a, a minimum count of five hemodialysis units who have, which have closed because the personnel became infected or because the personnel do not come to work anymore because they don't want to get in contact with COVID-19 patients. So this means again that most the dialysis patients from these units become displaced and have to transfer to other hemodialysis units, which are full to capacity. Now, for the hospitals which accept COVID patients, there's a very slow turnaround time for the results of the RT-PCR tests. And this, will, and this results to the prolonged hospital stay of the end-stage renal disease patients. We know that in the epidemic, there is equipment and personnel shortages and therefore national and even worldwide preparedness has to be put in place for this will require a lot of flexible algorithms and coordinations and sharing resources and for the hemodialysis patients in the times of the COVID there is really a need for designated COVID dialysis units in the different parts of the country to cater to the needs of this special group of patients. Some would have res resolved, uh, some would have, uh, some are now reducing the dialysis frequency to two times a week because this means less exposure to potential coronavirus infection for the patients and staff reduction in dialysis staff work, including reduced time for cleaning of the machines between treatments. And at the end of the day, there's greater spacing of patients because you're dialyzing less patients, reduced transportation needs, and more importantly, the conservation of the very important personal protective equipment. But there are disadvantages to the two times a week dialysis. Even uh, three times a week dialysis is insufficient for the management of hypervolemia and patients are at high risk of cardiovascular events and death during the long interdialytic period. Transitioning a large population of patients with multiple morbidity to twice weekly dialysis is likely to amplify the risk of cardiovascular events in the longer interdialytic period which in turn will result in undesirable increase in healthcare and personal protective equipment utilization. So how do we protect hemodialysis patients? And we have this uh, 
uh, suggestions from the different societies, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the Era Edda, and Asian Societies of Nephrology, education of patients, screening and recognition of symptoms, and all the and the use of the PPEs. So these are steps in mitigating the spread of COVID in the dialysis unit. So in summary, the effect of COVID-19 on the hemodialysis patients. These patients present with a wide range of symptoms and a significant portion of them being asymptomatic. There is prolonged positivity of pharyngeal swabs. The maintenance hemodialysis patients are at increased risk of COVID-19 and its complication due to presence of multiple comorbid conditions. The logical aspects within the dialysis facility further increase the risk of disease transmission. And patients on hemodialysis who develop COVID-19 will have a high mortality. 25 to 30 percent of them will die. Okay. And the last class of patients that we're going to discuss will be the hospitalized patients. What is the prevalence of acute kidney injury in hospitalized patients? Here, in this meta-analysis of more than 70,000 patients and uh, looking at 10 articles, the prevalence of acute kidney injury is 0.83%. Let's look at the current situation there. Here is our census from the Philippine General Hospital. We had 265 cases as of May 11. The data was taken May 11. And the patients re referred to the, set, the division of nephrology. We had 50 referrals of confirmed COVID cases. Okay. So half of them will be the end-stage kidney disease patients on dialysis. Okay. So 24, we had 24 patients on dialysis, end-stage kidney, we were able to discharge only four patients. We had four mortality, and that means that we still have 16 patients. And what is the reason for this prolonged stay of the patients? Most of these patients are already stable, but number one, we still wait for, the neg for, for results of a negative test. And I have mentioned earlier that many patients cannot clear the virus Past, there is a prolonged stay of the virus and therefore a lot of these patients still remain COVID positive. For those who are COVID negative, the freestanding hemodialysis unit are really hesitant to accept these patients and that's the reason why we were able to accept only uh, to discharge only four of these patients. Now for those patients who did not have any kidney problems initially, but developed acute kidney injury, we had 18 of those patients. We're not able to discharge any, of one, any one of them yet. Our mortality is very high, 50%. We still have about 50% admitted. So you see here the high mortality of patients with acute kidney injury. And so we will, let's look at this study by Chang in Wuhan, in Wuhan of 701 patients who were diagnosed with COVID-19. The median age is 63 years. On admission, they already have evidences of kidney problems. 41% with, half of them would have proteinuria, one-fourth of them would have hematuria, and some a certain percentage having an elevated creatinine and BUN. The EGFR less than 60 is pres present in 13% of, of these patients and 5% of these patients with COVID develop acute kidney injury. The in-house hospital death, the in-hospital deaths in this particular hospital is 16%. So, here, you can see the risk for death if you have kidney disease. If you have proteinuria, high proteinuria, the hazards for death, the risk for death is 6.8 times. 6 times. 
the risk for hemat the risk for death if you patient presents with hematuria is um, eight is eight point seven is eight point nine times. But if you're going to look at acute kidney injury, okay. If the patient is in stage two acute kidney injury, there is a 3.5 risk of dying. And if the patient has stage three acute kidney injury, there is a 4.7 times increased risk of dying. Okay, so here's another um, study on acute kidney injury in patients who are hospitalized with COVID-19. This is a retrospective cohort from 13 hospitals in New York who are SARS positive. And here they noted that 37% of these patients developed acute kidney injury. And the development of acute kidney injury actually coincided with the time that these patients were mechanically ventilated. So these are the sicker patients. Those who would need mechanical ven ventilation would develop acute kidney injury. And how did this patient, what is the course of this patient? This particular patient who develop acute kidney injury, the mortality is 35%. So patients with COVID who develop acute kidney injury, one out of three of them would die. So in conclusion, acute kidney injury occurs frequently among patients with COVID-19. It occurs early and in temporal association with respiratory failure and is associated with a very poor prognosis. The COVID, the SARS, Coronavirus really affect uh, the kidneys. And here is a study on 26 autopsies of patients who died of COVID-19 patients who died because of respiratory failure. The average age was 69 years. Here they see evidences, they see here RBC aggregates the peritubular capillaries, which means that the blood flow to the peritubular capillary was very small, was very slow. And there are really evidences of acute tubular necrosis. And they saw the presence of the virus in the tubules and the podocytes. And this is easily seen here in this immunofluorescence studies of antibody staining. The virus are seen in the tubules of the kidneys. So direct parenchymal infection of tubular epithelial cells and podocytes are seen in patients with COVID-19. And here's the study showing that the kidneys really have a lot of receptors for ACE, uh, the, a lot of receptors for the SARS-CoV-2, and these are concentrated in the proximal tubule, okay? So here's the concentration of ACE2 in the proximal tubule. And it is not really surprising that these patients will uh, develop acute tubular injury because of uh, infiltration of the virus in the tubules. Okay. Again, here is the comparison between the staining for the ACE2 antibody. Here is the COVID, uh, here is the, the non-COVID patient, and here is the COVID patient, and you can see the st intense staining, so the upregulation of the ACE2 receptors in the tubular cells of the kidneys. Okay, so what is the basic pathophysiologic mechanism of acute kidney injury in the patient? It can be from the activation of angiotensin II. Okay, we said that because of the utilization of the virus, because the virus utilized A2, then angiotensin II is not, is not degraded. And now it is fully activated to under, and, was, and is now allowed 
to do its very deleterious effect. Okay. There is also the problem of the cytokine storm. When there is myeloid cell activation and the release of the cytokines. And there is a direct cell, direct viral invasion of the cells. There we, we have demonstrated that the virus can be seen in the tubular epithelial cells and the podocyte damage, but the virus can also invade the muscles and cause damage to the injury to the muscles, producing rhabdomyolysis. And rhabdomyolysis is one of the causes of acute kidney injury. However, the other very important thing is that there are crosstalks between the organs and the kidney, the heart and the kidney. That's why you have cardiorenal syndrome. The lungs and the kidney also talk to each other. So if any of these organs fail because of the sepsis, because of the acute cardiac and lung injury, the kidneys will also develop acute kidney injury. And we have several uh, procedures to do for the patients with COVID who would require blood purification or cleaning of the blood. First is to look at the indications, contraindications. I will go to the other slide to focus all this. Okay. So look at indications, contraindications, then start Prescribe the blood purification treatment. So choose the treatment. If the problem of the patient is just fluid overload, then we can just go on with the slow continuous ultrafiltration. If the patient has acute kidney injury, then we can do continuous veno veno hemodialysis or continuous veno veno hemodialysis. If the problem is the cytokine storm, then we need to remove the inflammatory mediators, and this we do hemoperfusion. If the problem is ARDS, we need support using ECMO with CRRT. And if the patient develops acute liver and kidney injury, then that is a, a very impossible situation. Okay. So what is hemoperfusion? Hemoperfusion is a very simple process. All you need is a vascular access and a blood pump to push the blood to the cartridge. And this is the cartridge which contains resin, which will absorb the cytokines, okay? So as blood flows down here, cytokines are absorbed and blood is returned back to the patient. Fluids and electrolytes will not be altered with the hemoperfusion. There is no fluid or electrolyte losses here. Now, if the patient needs additional blood purification, then the cartridge can be connected to, or it can be placed in series with the usual hemodialysis, uh, with the usual hemodialysis dialyzer. So here is a patient who is undergoing hemoperfusion because of the cytokine storm from sepsis and also undergoing hemodialysis because of acute kidney injury. So what is the role now of hemoperfusion? If we're going to look at the invasion of the coronavirus to the organs, particularly the lungs, the lungs will then need support and uh, it can be done through the mechanical ventilator or through the extracorporeal membrane uh, membrane oxygenation, but all of these things will trigger a cytokine release. And so for the cytokine release, we can opt to do hemoperfusion to remove these mediators, which are mostly inflammatory. Okay, here, are, uh, these are examples of the cytokines. They're, Cytokines are very complex because they have very, very varied actions. They have the interferons. They are regulators of innate immunity. They are the interleukins, which have uh, growth and uh, different, uh, which are mainly pro-inflammatory. 
the chemokines, which are again low in pro-inflammatory, and then tumor necrosis factor, which are pro-inflammatory. And how would the hemoperfusion handle this? Let's look at this study using a certain um, cartridge with, which adsorb the cytokines. And here you can see that uh, interleukin-6, which is a very important pro-inflammatory uh, cytokine, is removed by this particular sorbent. Interleukin-6, interleukin-10, and tumor necrosis factor are removed significantly by, uh, by hemoperfusion procedure. Again, in another study, we see here the decrease in the various, uh, in the levels of the various inflam inflammatory mediators. This is day one, day two, day three of the group who were placed on, hem on hemoperfusion compared to the group who were just placed on standard, standard care alone. So for interleukin-8, you can see the decrease in, uh, in the levels of the inflammatory mediators compared to those who are not placed on hemoperfusion. And here you see this decrease in the levels of interleukin-6. Now, in this particular study, it is noted that better clinical outcome is seen if hemoperfusion is started earlier. So in this particular study, more survivors were seen if hemoperfusion was done less than 48 hours before, after admission to the intensive care unit compared to when the hemoperfusion was done more than 48 hours after ICU admission. And the length of hospital stay for those uh, who were placed on uh, earlier, uh, earlier hemoperfusion, the length of hospital stay was shorter if the hemoperfusion was done earlier. Again, uh, this is the effect of hemoperfusion on extrapulmonary sepsis induced lung injury. Again, here the patients were randomized to the hemoadsorbed absorption or hemoperfusion group and the control group. And you can see that the duration of mechanical ventilation is shortened. Mechanical ventilation free days. Uh, you have um, more, you have now a longer mechanical ventilation free days. You have uh, shorter CRRT hours, which means that the patient recovered from the kidney failure. There is shorter duration of stay in the ICU. The ICU mortality is much, much lower. The 28-day mortality is also much, much lower. And improvement in functional capacity is better. OK, so here's my last slides. And I'd just like to summarize the key points of acute kidney injury in the SARS-CoV-2 infected patients. Acute kidney injury is frequently observed in ARDS patients affected by different comorbidities. And the similar findings were observed in the Wuhan COVID-19 infected patients. ARDS-associated acute kidney injury may be ascribed to several causes, including an inflammatory immune reaction characterized by an enhanced release of circulating mediators able to interact and damage kidney resident cells. The kidney epithelial cell viral infection may worsen the local inflammatory response and consequently the incidence and duration of acute kidney injury. Comorbidities may be associated with a pre-existing chronic decline of kidney function and a tendency to develop acute kidney episodes. Identification therefore of patients with AKI may lead to better allocation of hospital resources. The use of extracorporeal blood purification techniques and antiviral therapies may theoretically limit the systemic and local inflammatory response, at least in part responsible for multiple organ failures, including acute kidney injury. And the mortality rate of COVID-19 patients who develop acute kidney injury is very high. That's the highest mortality rate in the series presented in the, in the study presented earlier, 
the mortality rate here is about 38%. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Elizabeth. That was an interesting uh, presentation po. Uh, what really particularly struck me po was the mortality rate po no, of uh, those who would require dialysis and those uh, who have been affected by COVID-19 is uh, particularly high for 25 to 30 percent po. Um, moving on po, uh, Dr. Rabet and Dr. Susie, I think uh, we, would, we could be entertaining a few questions uh, that will be coming in via the Q&A. A few of those questions po uh, have, been, have started to trickle in. The question that we have right now will be, uh, first one, since we are not able to measure IL-6 here in the Philippines, can we use ferritin, C-reactive protein, uh, LDH as a substitute to measure response to hemoperfusion? And if yes, how soon can we expect a decrease? Dr. Um. Uh, the surrogate marker that we're using for in IL, IL6, interleukin-6, is CRP. So, but if you do hemoperfusion, for example, we, we do measure the inflammatory markers, also the ferritin and CRP. After one, the, one hemoperfusion procedure, we will see already the decrease in the levels of the ferritin and CRP. And, and we do see that in, among patients uh, on uh, where hemo, hemoperfusion was done. Now, interleukin-6 test is going to be available in PGH. Uh, we are already we are already in the process of, or I think it's already in place now, in the, the examination for interleukin-6. Okay, thank you. Beth, there's another question here. Are we considering uh, oh no. Are there any proposed alternative therapies for uh, chronic kidney disease patients under ACE ARBS infected with COVID-19? Well, during this time of pandemic, uh, maybe they can be shifted. If they are, but of course they are all high risk. No, if they are stable and they don't, they really isolate themselves. They don't. They are low risk patients in the sense that uh, they have very minimal contact with the outside world, then they can continue with the ACE-R. But if they are high-risk patients, they can be shifted temporarily to another antihypertensive medicine. So they, we can shift them to calcium, uh, cal calcium channel blockers. Okay. Um, Emmanuel also has uh, another question. He asked the first question. Are we considering uh, for chronic renal disease patients or kidney transplant patients, are they considered potential candidates for convalescent plasma therapy? Well, actually, it's not contraindicated. Uh, convalescent plasma therapy, I don't think it's contraindicated for kidney transplant patients. Okay. Okay. Um, Dr. Abet, there's a, another question uh, on the Q&A. What is the average duration of a hemoperfusion treatment? Usually, the, the manufacturer will say that we can use only the cartridge for two hours because uh, the, the resin becomes saturated already with, uh, with the cytokines. It, depends, it really depends on the type of cartridge that you use. In the study by Professor Ronco, his, the cartridge that he used can last for 12 hours. So it is a 12-hour procedure. But some of the cartridges can only have, by manufacturer's uh, standard, the, the a recommended uh, two hours. Although we sometimes extend to three hours or four hours, the Wuhan group would extend using the same dialyzer, uh, the, the same cartridge, recommending two hours, they would extend it to about four to six hours. Okay. Uh, next question naman po, uh, Dr. Rabeth, is uh, related to survival rate. So, survival rate of uh, COVID patients who underwent hemoperfusion with or without tocilizumab? Uh, 
We don't have any data yet on that. So we don't have any Philippine data yet. And the Philippine Society of Nephrology is actually in the process of conducting a study to look into that, no, acute kidney injury, use of tocilizumab. We are, uh, we are currently conducting a study on that. So we don't have any, uh, any data yet on mortality rates for these kinds of patients. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Montemayor. Uh, so for, for our um, attendees, po, uh, we will also be flashing po our um, post-presentation survey. It is a, a survey po on uh, the presentation that was given by our excellent resource speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Montemayor. So uh, and those are being flashed now on the screen. Uh, first question is that the, the presenter demonstrated the thorough knowledge of the webinar topic, it's uh, it's uh, obviously sort of a Likert scale. The second one is uh, the presenter was well prepared and organized. The third question, the presenter spoke clearly and audibly. Fourth question, the presenter used appropriate language with technical medical jargons adequately explained. And the last question, the fifth one, the presenter used appropriate workshop training webinar techniques. So as our attendees po are answering this uh, post-presenter uh, questions, uh, maybe we could move on to a different set of questions po. Uh, there's another question, uh, Dr. Montemayor. Um, are we expecting electrolyte imbalances in acute kidney injury associated with COVID-19 since yeah. it is... Uh, a lot of, yes, yes, yeah, because this is acute kidney injury and then of course you can expect hyperkalemia and a lot of uh, electrolyte problems here because of the acute, because of the nature of the kidney problem. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Beth, you know, there are lots of very positive comments coming here that it's an amazing presentation. I think we're all appreciating uh, the time that you put into the presentation itself, no? Parang, parang gusto na namin lahat mag-nephrology. <laughs> okay. Uh, Taka mo na. Okay, so there's a question here, no? You talked about uh, the need for dedicated COVID uh, dialysis centers. Would you like to expound a little bit more on what you meant by that? Because this now has implications for telehealth and for, I guess, there are a lot of nephrologists who are watching us right now. So what, what are your, can you expound a little bit on how you imagine the new normal for the practice of nephrology, given all of the things that you said about the vulnerability of the kidneys to SARS-CoV-2. So uh, would you like to expound on that a little bit? Yeah, because it is very difficult to mix the COVID positive and the COVID negative patients in the hemodialysis unit. So uh, the, the patient can easily, the non-infected one can easily get infected from these patients. So it is best that we have really a dedicated hemodialysis unit where the COVID positive patients can go to for their dialysis and then go back to their, to their previous dialysis center when they turn negative. I have mentioned that in PGH, we are really unable to dial, to discharge the patients because of the long because we because we cannot get a negative results so we need two negative results before we can discharge the patients and it this takes time and these are very and some of these are stable patients who are just waiting for their covid results to turn positive so while they're there we cannot admit the more serious patients so remember that pgh is a center, is a referral center for the more serious patients. So if we cannot discharge patients, then we cannot accept new ones because we have saturated already our resources. So we need this dedicated center which we can cater and which and to and to which we can refer to our stable COVID positive patients. Uh, so that we can accept new, new, uh, new severe cases. Um, Beth, you know, there, there's some new technology that's come out that I just I was just reading about it last night. Where 
uh, they're actually doing antibody testing using a venipuncture, 2 ml of 2 ml of blood, um, which has very high specificity sensitivity. It's called Architect. Uh, I think it's it's um, what if you if we had a better test for antibodies, would that help you in moving patients? Uh, moving patients from uh, COVID to non-COVID dialysis? Yeah, we just need a very reliable test to really differentiate the COVID and the non-COVID patients. No? So as, yeah. as it is now, there are a lot of patients, COVID patients who are asymptomatic and they can really transmit the infection within the unit. So a rapid test, which is very reliable, is going to be re really very helpful to right. discriminate this, uh, to yeah, to discriminate this uh, COVID and the non-COVID patients. And so we can easily, uh, we can be rest assured that the the infection is not lingering in the union. Right. So it's still it still boils down to our ability to diagnose. No, I think that's where yes, we're, yes. we're all struggling. Yes. We would like to propose, um, in fact, the Philippine Society of Nephrology would like to propose that all hemodialysis patients undergo diagnostic testing because there are so many of them. And now I've asked the different medical directors if they have COVID positive patients in their hemodialysis unit. And a lot of them are really saying that, yes, they have, uh, COVID positive patients in the unit. So the number of COVID positive patients in the hemodialysis units is in really increasing and we should really be prepared for a greater number of these patients because we cannot stop them from coming to the hemodialysis unit. They have to be there three times a week. No? They cannot stop their treat the hemodialysis treatment. Yeah, and then in, in the case of um, what that means in terms of cost is that we'll have to have extra PPE. Uh, yeah, that, that's true. For dialysis. Yeah, and that's true. And that's why a very a dedicated hemodialysis unit for the COVID will really um, limit the cost of the PPEs because we just give the PPEs to those who will cater to the COVID positive patients. So those in the regular dialysis unit where all which, uh, which cater to the non-COVID patients will just have the usual protection. Right. Uh, Raymond, over to you. Okay. Yes, thank you, Dr. Susie. Um, Dr. Beth, um, another question would be uh, related to the clinical correlation of ionized calcium in a high-risk COVID-19 patient. No, oh, actually, we don't. I, I, I don't have any, uh, no, any data on that. Okay. Uh, thank you, ma'am. And what about any experiences for doing continuous veno venous hemofiltration or uh, CVVHD with a combination of ECMO? Yeah, yeah. It is part of the of the management of the patient if they have uh, if they have acute kidney injury. Okay. And then further questions po from Emmanuel Garcia. Um, are we now considering hematuria and proteinuria as significant indicators of prognosis in the course of COVID-19 patients? Well, based on the, on the study, that it is a significant predictor of mortality. So we just have to really look at the, the hematuria and the proteinuria implies the presence of an existing kidney disease. So it just really all boil boil down to that, no? The presence of an existing kidney disease, or the pre or or the presence of an ongoing kidney injury. Okay. So if it is present, then we just really sometimes we ignore the presence of hematuria or proteinuria in the urine, but it can prognosticate our uh, patient. Okay. Uh... Are there any questions on your side, Dr. Susie? Uh, uh, no more. You know, I, I thought we would be able to get uh, PhilHealth CEO and President uh, Ricardo Morales to close the program, but unfortunately, he's in a meeting with the OFWs. So uh, we will ask, we'll ask him to, to join us at another time. But I just wanted to ask Dr. Beth, uh, I know 
it seems to me that there are a lot of fellows and residents who are listening because the questions are highly technical. So would you have some parting words for them or some advice? Because, um, it, you know, uh, what we're enjoying about this webinar is that we're able to do a deep dive, go back into basic uh, physiology, pharmacology, and really try to understand why we do things. Because there's a lot of misinformation out there about what should be done and how do you manage patient, patients and so on. So when we do this kind of deep dive, especially for those who are at the front line, I think it's very helpful. So uh, Dr. Beth, do you have any, um, any parting words for them or uh, advice? That you'd like to give them right now? Yes. Um, for the patient, because the, the fellows and the residents will be the ones taking care of, the, of our patients. And knowing that kidney patients, if they do develop COVID disease, will have a high mortality. Okay? The main thing here is prevention. So if you have a patient with kidney disease, emphasize all the preventive measures. They are the group of patients who would require this to, uh, a more, a, a stricter preventive measures, social distancing, hand washing, use of masks, all those things. The, the message is really going to be very simple. Prevent, help us, Help us help the patients prevent themselves from getting the coronavirus. Okay. Okay. So I think that's a wonderful way to end our, our webinar. Uh, and congratulations, Dr. Beth. Uh, there's, I, I'm getting a lot of text messages saying that they really, really learned a lot from your, uh, really learned a lot from your, from your talk and. Um, we want to thank you again for your time. We know you're very, very busy and we hope in the future when there are new updates, we can invite you again to, to speak. So on, on behalf of the University of the Philippines and all our partners who made this possible and the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation, I'd like to thank you, our audience, all of you who are on the webinar and those of you who are watching the playback. We hope this has been useful for you, that we can continue to learn, to share ideas, to understand and to network. Um, using technology that helps us uh, cut through our distance and the barriers of time and space that, that are now pre uh, preventing us from interacting more. So thank you very much. We hope you'll make uh, every Friday a habit. Uh, every Friday from 12 to 2, we will have these uh, highly specialized discussions on stop COVID deaths, clinical management of um, updates on clinical management of uh, COVID-19. So thank you so much. And um, we hope to see you next time. Next time we're gonna have Dr. Gene Solante. He is uh, the head of adult infectious disease uh, unit of San Lazaro Hospital. He's going to be talking about um, COVID and other infections. So if you recall earlier on, uh, one of the first deaths was a patient who had HIV and then COVID and TB. And so he's going to talk now about all of these interactions among infections and much uh, very similar to what uh, Dr. Montemayor has talked about. Uh, having these other infections also presents very high risk for severe morbidity and, and for mortality. So we hope to see you next week. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Susie, and thank you also to our excellent resource speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Montemayor. Before we formally close our webinar for today, I'd just like to acknowledge that we are the presence of our attendees from multiple um, cities and areas. We have attendees po coming from Region 5 in Bicol, from Partido State University, Camarines Sur, uh, from Region 2, Cagayan Valley, from Apayao, Cagayan Medical Center, from Region 10 in Northern Mindanao, Misamis Oriental Provincial Hospital, and UP Vasayas in Niagao, Iloilo, which is from Region 6, Western Visayas, and from Region 8 in Caraga Region, Bislig District Hospital in Bislig, Surigao del Sur. Oh. So that's how um, widespread po at uh, talaga pong nakaabot ang ating... Uh, oh, hindi mo nakita yung Ministry of Health, Oman? 
Yes, yun po. Sabihin ko pa lang po that, that even uh, the presentation of Dr. Montemayor has gone international. We have attendees po from Saudi Arabia and also from Oman and also from the United States. So thank you for imparting your knowledge, Dr. Montemayor. And as always, uh, maraming salamat po. And, and your presentation was very well received. Uh, we are sharing po the poll results uh, for your presentation and uh, at least 84% of your uh, of all of the answers po of all of the attendees said that they strongly agree in terms of the acceptability and well preparedness and organization and your thorough knowledge of the webinar topic. Maraming salamat po, Dr. Montemayor. And to our attendees po, uh, tune in next week for our Friday habit. Uh, uh, continue to join us from 12 noon to 2 p.m for this University of Philippines and PhilHealth webinar series. Raymond, we have to ask post-webinar questions. I don't think... Oh, yes. Opo, opo. The post-webinar questions. Would you mind answering, giving the correct answers, Dr. Montemayor, okay. for the three questions that you gave po? Yeah, of course, the receptor for SARS-CoV-2 is ACE2. And uh, the, the organ that has highest concentration, I've mentioned that the kidneys have a higher expressions of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 receptor compared to the lungs. And for the process of removing the cytokine, uh, hemoperfusion will be the procedure of choice, the treatment of choice. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Montemayor. I hope everyone got 100% on the second, uh, second round of answering. <laughs> we really learned a lot. Salamat again, Dr. Beth. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Susie, for inviting me. Thank you very much, Raymond. Thank you so much, Dr. Montemayor, and thank you, Dr. Mercado. At uh, sama-sama po tayo ulit uh, for next week's webinar. Uh, we will, as Dr. Susie Mercado mentioned, we will be talking about um, infectious from a talk from an infectious disease expert from the San Lazaro Hospital talking about the co-infections uh, for a patient who has COVID-19. So, maraming salamat po ulit. Uh, keep safe, keep healthy, and see you online. <music>